HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Many people in our food community have been seriously impacted by Superstorm Sandy, and our hearts go out to them. At HRN, we've been covering these stories since the storm hit. To learn more, visit our website at www.heritageradionetwork.org. Today's program has been brought to you by Hearst Ranch, the nation's largest single-source supplier of free-range, all-natural, grass-fed, and grass-finished beef. For more information, visit hearstranch.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network, broadcasting live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. If you like this program, visit heritageradionetwork.org for thousands more. Right. It is Thursday, one o'clock, and once again you've tuned into the Heritage Radio Network. You're listening to the Farm Report, and I'm your host, Aaron Fairbanks. We are coming to you live from the back of Roberta's Pizza in beautiful Bushwick, Brooklyn. And we are on the line today with Steve Melanowski of Fisher Island Oyster Farm. Steve, welcome to the show. Uh thank you, Aaron. Pleasure. Well, it's great to have you on. So a few weeks ago, we spoke with John Lowell, uh, the owner of East Dennis Oyster Farm, and, and talked through some of the basics of his operation. And I was curious, you know, you guys do things a little differently there. You're a hatchery, you have the nursery, and then, you know, your final grow it area. So I thought maybe we could start, um, you know, where it all begins for the oysters um, and, and talk a little bit about the seed operation that you guys have going um, and so maybe you can just walk us through, uh, you know, operationally uh, how oysters are made or grown, I guess. Well, we, we have a, uh, it's actually a quite, quite a small facility. It's about 20 feet by 80 feet, in our, literally in our backyard. And when my wife Sarah and I are packing up oysters for restaurants, uh, we will, during a given season, go through about a million oysters and we'll pick out a hundred of those that that are perfect in our eyes, and we'll use those for brood stock. Those will be the parent stock for our following year's production. And we can bring those in in uh, anywhere from December on, and by bringing them into the hatchery and holding them in warm water, feeding them a lot of food, we essentially trick them into thinking it's July when they would normally spawn out in the wild. We can then spawn them in the hatchery, and from then uh, until they actually leave the hatchery, it'll take anywhere from four to six weeks, and we'll grow them to a size of about two or three millimeters in the hatchery. Then they go up to a salt pond here on the island where they'll spend their first year, and um, most of those will get sold to other growers, and we'll put a portion of those at our grow-out site and then grow them up to market size. So can you tell me when you're selecting an oyster um, to, be, to be using as your breeding stock, are the, selection, are the traits that you're looking for in a breeding oyster different than I would be looking for in an eating oyster? Uh, well, somewhat. Initially, we, we've had our hatchery going for about 15 or 16 years now. And initially what we were selecting for was primarily growth rate because we wanted to increase the yields in our system. 
and it got to the point where the <laughs> the oysters were were uh, the average size of the oysters was where we wanted it and so rather than continuing to select for growth rate what we then selected for was shape and depth of cup and so you know those are those are things that in, are important um, presentation presentation on a plate they can also also affect the 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 meat yield in an oyster and um, basically what we're doing when we're doing that selection now is we're we're picking out 100 oysters that are um, an oyster that we would like to have uh, fill our boxes um, it, it's a, an oyster that has a size and shape that we feel um, most of our customers would like we have no effect on the taste of the meat unfortunately or fortunately, I guess. <laughs> so, I mean, you mentioned um, like the depth of the cup and the size of the oyster. Can you be a little bit more specific about about both of those measurements and then any others, I mean, that, that might be indicative of, of what you would be choosing? You know, how deep is a, is a deep cup and, you know, what is the right size oyster for your operation? Well, we, we like to pack up oysters that are somewhere between three and four inches, and we like those to be not only uniform in size, but also uniform in shape. And you can, you can have a very fast-growing oyster that, that gets to a three or four-inch size, but is very flat and does not have a deep cup, and therefore the meat yield would be very low. The other nice thing about a deep cup is that when when you present them, um, they they have that that uh, that cavity for for holding the liquor inside the shell. So I would say that uh, you know our cup depth. I'm 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 looking at my fingers right now as I <laughs> try to estimate it. I'd, I'd say it's probably about an inch and a half is what we go for, and um, it's it's definitely a trait that we know is heritable because we see that cup even in our very small fast growing seed. So you when when you when you've selected kind of the group for spawning and you bring them back to the area where you're going to hatch them out. I mean, what can you tell us a little bit about oyster sex and like how that that happens? I mean, what's the next step after you've picked the oysters that determine you know, they have the traits you're looking for. Are there male and female oysters, or how, how do they propagate? Right. Well, there, there's no way of telling the oyster sex until it actually spawns. And when it's spawning, you can, you can readily tell the sperm from the eggs. The sperm looks like smoke coming out of the side of the shell, and, and the eggs, there's actually a different motion that the females use to release the eggs from the shell, and they look more granular. So when they're spawning... Um, you can tell the, the females from the males, which is important because the, uh, you, you have to separate them. And every time we're spawning, what we're, what we're most interested in is getting the eggs from the females because it takes very little sperm to, to fertilize a lot of eggs. Now, the, it, it, it's, oysters are, are more interesting in than clams, for example, in that respect, because clams will, will uh, all, all clams, and I'm talking about hard clams now, are born males, and then during the first year, approximately 50% of them will, will change to females and remain that way for the rest of their lives. Oysters, on the other hand, can change sex from one season to another. So there's no, with clams, you can, you can um, pick out your favorite brood stock, and after they spawn, you can mark the males and the females, and then you can put them in a holding facility and use them the following year and know which ones are males and females. But you can't do that with oysters because they can actually change sex from one season to another. And so you wouldn't, I mean, would you hold on to oysters over a, a season to, to use them to spawn a second time? Uh, we have occasionally done that, and um, we we we've done that because in our system it takes it takes our oysters two seasons to get up to market size. So we can go uh, a period of of years where we're alternating one year from the next 
the uh, the the a group of oysters, a genetically similar group of oysters that were spawning. So every other year, that same genetic group is being spawned. After a number of generations, um, we we have crossed those two year classes together, and we've done that because it's it's uh, it's a good idea to have as much genetic diversity in your population as possible. But for the most part, what we do is uh, we just select out oysters each year that we use for broodstock. Interesting. So you could essentially have, uh, I mean, like the, uh, I'm trying, I keep wanting to make an off-color joke about some royal family and like inbreeding, but uh, everything seems wildly appropriate, inappropriate. Well, the, <laughs> inbreeding, the inbreeding issue is always kind of looming in the background. Okay. And you want to do what you can to prevent that. And you know, one, one way one way you you can you can put that off is by making sure that when when you do a spawning, you're you're taking eggs and sperm from a number of oysters instead of just a couple. And then in our case, another way that we can do that is is by crossing these alternate year classes. And so, I mean, is it like in um, in other forms of agriculture, uh, I think in particular with, you know, dairy animals, where there's some kind of, there's a cachet to having an open herd or a closed herd. Is, is that similar for a, for an oyster population where there's a certain amount of cachet in, into having a, a, a genetic lineage that's that's not open? Uh, a- absolutely. And we, we have heard firsthand from our seed customers that our seed is very different than seed that they might get someplace else. And during years where they've gotten seed from a couple of places and grown them side by side in the same types of systems, the growth rates have been different and the shape of the oyster has been different. So that is, uh, you know, it's, it, it's something that, that we would like to try to protect but it's really not possible. Um, we have no. Once we send that seed out to other growers, we have no control over where it might end up after they've grown it out. So you know, it's perfectly possible that that somebody um, in Rhode Island or Massachusetts that buys our seed will grow it out and decide that they want to do business with another hatchery and and take some of those oysters and give them to that other hatchery, and that other hatchery can spawn them. There's nothing preventing that from happening. Well, and that's interesting because that's a case across, you know, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, vegetable or fruit population where where the seeds, you know, the culture around seeds is not one of where, you know, one of ownership where someone has a certain right to to a seed. It's interesting to hear that kind of reflected in the oyster world. Right, um, we're, we're not Monsanto's. <laughs> um, thankfully. And Thankfully. so, so the the spawning process. So you said you you know you artificially heat the water. You know you you create a warm environment to kind of trick the oysters into thinking that it's you know seasonally appropriate for them to start spawning. And this process is this something that you're doing all year round, or are there particular ty- times of year, or what's the schedule for for hatching? You know, hatching out. Or w- well, our our hatchery season uh, starts. In about a week or so, so we'll we'll start the latter part of November, getting our phytoplankton cultures up and running, and that will take us. Uh, it'll take us almost a month to get the whole system, the whole food system, up and running. And as it's coming up in about two weeks, uh, three weeks, we'll bring some brood stock in, and then we'll run our hatchery from from essentially mid-December until about the end of June. And, and then why, that, why that time of year? Well, it, what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to produce small seed that is ready to go when the water temperature's warm enough in the spring for them to start growing. So the oysters hibernate in the wintertime and, and start growing when the, when the water temperature is roughly 12 degrees centigrade. And in our salt pond, that happens in mid-April. So we we try to get a we try to time our production so that we have small seed in our nursery pond 
right when it gets warm enough for the pond to start growing. Excellent. And and then we 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 only run it till June because by that time, if you're if you spawn later than June, you'll end up with small seed. You know, maybe by the end of July, and at that point, the the oysters won't get large enough before the end of the season um, for them to be um, for the seed primarily to be marketable to other growers. Interesting. So we're going to take a a short break. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the food that these seedlings will be eating while they're spending the time in your hatchery. But so hang tight. We'll be back in a few moments. Okay. Listening to Diesel Boy. On the Heritage Radio Network. Ranch grass fed beef. Pasture raised on 150,000 acres in Central California. Hearst Ranch grass fed beef, free range, sustainably produced, humane. Hearst Ranch grass fed beef, the authentic flavor of the American West. You're listening to the Heritage Radio Network. You're tuned into the Farm Report, where we are exploring musical contrast in our break segment. So, Steve, I hope we didn't catch you too off guard there with the Diesel Boy. Um, no, I enjoyed it. <laughs> good, good. A little bit of, uh, uh, I don't even know. Joe, I mean, how would we, what type of music would we say that is? Um, I'm not a really that big into electronic music, but I'm pretty sure that is dubstep. Dubstep. Uh, I think it's pretty awesome. So, Steve, we have been talking about um, growing out oysters and your hatchery operation up there at the Fisher Island Oyster Farm. And we have kind of worked our way through spawning, um, but you brought up that, you know, before you actually bring the oysters to spawn at the hatchery, that you spend uh, a good four weeks or so getting the food supply ready. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the oysters will be eating um, while their the seedlings are growing out. Yeah, we we really in our hatchery. Uh, well, we have an attached greenhouse that we grow our food in, but in the hatchery system, there's really two distinct culture systems going on. One is culturing the animals, and the other is culturing the food that they eat. And those are two very different systems. And and actually. Um, over the years, we've found the growing the food to be more challenging than than growing the oyster seed themselves. It what we use are um, it varies. It's either three or four different species of phytoplankton, and these are these are species that that you wouldn't find necessarily find in Long Island Sound. But they've they've got track records that have, that have been proven over the years to be um, easy to grow in a culture system and adequate um, and an adequate food supply for the small oysters. So it's kind of a compromise there. And we start out with with cultures that we we get from a, uh, a laboratory in Maine that archives all sorts of different species of phytoplankton. And the system has to be very sterile. The individual containers have to have absolutely nothing growing in them except for those species of phytoplankton that we're culturing. And um, it, uh, the system that we have is a continuous production system, so we produce 
oh, about 750 gallons of of dense culture a day that's available to feed the small oysters and the larvae. Wow. So the it can you just help me picture this? I mean, what what are what are the holding tanks or or buckets? I mean, what does it look like? You have um, well, we have we have forty individual containers, and those containers are are uh, wire mesh cylinders that have plastic bags in them. They're two feet in diameter and six feet tall, and the there is a continuous supply of sterile water that sterile seawater that that flows into these bags actually drips into the bags and for every drop that goes in a drop overflows and that's collected and then distributed throughout the hatchery to our different culture systems it uh each of, each of those has there's a lot of glassware there's a lot of bubbling going on uh, people have walked in there and said oh this looks like a still you know, it's it's uh, it's a little hard to describe without actually showing you a picture. Wow, fascinating! So, you can how long are the how long does it take to hatch out a seed, and and how um you know how fast is the growth you know from the you know fertilized egg to the seed? The seed you said is about two millimeters. Is that right? Two millimeters when we take it to the pond and. You know that that can range anywhere from from five or six weeks up to two months, depending on how much food we have available to feed them. So what happens initially? We we will do our first spawning um, usually the first week of January, and and that first group that we spawn and the, and the seed that results from that have plenty of food because we haven't filled the hatchery up. But then as soon as that group goes through. <clears throat> Excuse me. As soon as that group of larvae um, goes through our larval culture system, we spawn again, and within by by about the end of February, then our entire hatchery is full of, of small oysters that we're trying to grow up to that two millimeters and get out to the pond. And in in our case, we're, we're we become very food limited, and and um, so we have. Uh, we have some some oysters that get a lot of food and grow very quickly and get up to the pond, and others that are just kind of in a holding pattern till they till they get to that one tank that we have that we we feed a lot of food. So it's it, it's hard to see. there is no set time schedule, but I would say you know it's it's like six to eight or ten weeks in our system. And you know the when you're kind of food, I'll use the term food insecure at at the hatchery, that is a result. Uh, like, what's the barrier there? Is that a, a space issue? Is it? I mean, how would you overcome that, or is that just inherent to to the system, or is that like an infrastructure build out that you could essentially like r- you know reconcile with like some type of additional build out? Uh, we we definitely could build out our algal system and, and produce more food and, and therefore produce more oysters. Um, we, in fact, right, right as we speak, we're just finishing up an expansion of our, of our food system, and we have pretty much expanded it to be as large as it can be given the configuration of our, of our property. Um, and then uh, another consideration is the... Uh, we're pretty much at the size we'd like to be. We we don't have any aspirations of getting much larger than we are right now, and um, we're just right now we're just trying to maintain the size that we we are, the business that we have, and um, you know, trying to perfect our system. And we're we're always fiddling with it, and and uh, that's really the challenge of running a hatchery: trying to make it more efficient, more energy efficient, and space efficient. So, um, from the um, when when the oysters are have reached the size that they can go out into the pond, it, just so I'm clear, you you wouldn't sell them. They don't go onto the seed market until after they've spent the year in the pond. Is that right? Well, we 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 sell seed anywhere from one millimeter up to about two and a half inches. So we'll we'll sell seed directly out of the hatchery. 
will sell seed after it's been at the pond for a few weeks, and uh, and then will grow the seed out for a full season and sell it the following spring. So it's it's a lot of when, when you add to that the market oysters that we sell, it's it's really a lot of product diversity that we have. Even though it's all oysters, it's a lot of product diversity, and and that has served us well over the years. Um, in this business, it is uh, absolutely necessary to try to hedge your bets wherever you can. And we have, in 15 years, we've we've only had one year where everything in our system at all the different life stages grew as well as it possibly could. During every other year, we've we've had at least one part of the system that not, has not performed up to potential. And by having that product diversity, and a lot of that diversity is in the different size seed that we sell, by having that product diversity, we've been able to keep our, our bottom line uh, pretty stable from year to year. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the things I was thinking about preparing for the interview is you have the hatchery program, and then I know that you guys do wholesale for your oysters, and then are you retailing your oysters as well? Uh, most of our oysters we sell direct to restaurants. Okay. We have a couple of distributors. I, I would guess right now it's about 30% that go through distributors and 70% go direct to restaurants. And so the pond, why, why, the, why the interim step at the pond? Why not go directly? Uh, you know, what, what, what do you gain from that? Uh, that's a great question. We, we have initially, we tried to do everything at our grow-out site where we grow our marketable oysters. And there are there are disease issues. Uh, one disease in particular, in particular, that's called juvenile oyster disease, that that uh, is very much an issue at our grow out site. Affects small oysters, but not large oysters. And there are also a couple of other disease organisms, MSX and Dermo, which which initially started in. in uh, Delaware Bay in the Chesapeake and in the late 50s and 60s and have kind of moved up the coast since then, um, on and off have been very serious problems in Long Island Sound. And those disease organisms, all three of those disease organisms, are very sensitive to low salinities. And our nursery pond here on the island is a brackish water pond. It's, it's spring-fed with fresh water. Um, it gets very limited influxes of seawater. So it has served over the years as a refuge from those disease organisms. And um, also the, the growth rates in that pond for small seed uh, is, are very good. So it's, it's uh, and, and another, another great advantage of it is that it's very well protected. So in the wintertime, um, hopefully we get a freeze in there. The ice, we grow everything in suspension culture. The ice just locks everything in, and no matter how hard the wind's blowing, we never have to worry about it. So, so it, it is, uh, we, we could not run our business without it. It's absolutely vital to our business. And is, did you guys make the pond, or was it existing on the? No, it's it's interesting. It was it was a freshwater reservoir for Fisher's Island until the '38 hurricane, and the hurricane breached the pond. The, it was then pumped out. It's a 35 acre pond that's six to 20 feet deep. Mammoth effort to pump it out, and then soon after, and I'm not sure how many years, but soon after it was pumped out and about to be put into operation as, again as a reservoir, there was another big storm that breached the pond again. So they gave up on that as a reservoir, and it, uh, as I said, it's spring-fed, and during, during moon tides and storms, we get influxes of salt water. It's it, uh, very interesting to me that the salinity stays as as stable as it does over the years, um, but it it has. It's it's very high right now because it got breached during Sandy, um, and we're very interested to see how long it takes it to get back down to to the lower salinities that we like to have in there. Wow, it seems like somehow you you guys were perfectly positioned for oyster production. Well, we we we. 
we were not just because of the pond, but there was also because there there was a guy by the name of Kerry Matheson who first did oyster culture in the pond in the mid '60s, and he he grew seed in the pond. Most of it was destined for the Katuit Oyster Company on the Cape, uh, but he grew seed in the pond from '65 until about. 15 years ago, and we took over the the pond from him when he retired and um, built it up from there. Wow. So I'm, I'm bummed because we are, we are just about out of time. I know uh, we would love to have you come back because we haven't even tucked into the whole uh, end, end product um, and going to talk a little bit about the next stage uh, for, with regards to final grow out. Um, if people do want to learn more about your operation, you guys have a great website, www.fisherislandoysters.com. And then I was curious, um, do you know if people are interested here in the city or in other parts of the country in tasting some of your oysters? Are there places that they can find them, or can they order directly from you guys, or what's the so best way? Can, people can order directly from us, and we've, we've also we've got about 50 restaurants in Manhattan um, and the surrounding areas where our oysters are available. And um, there is one, one, one other thing I'd like to mention, Aaron, if I could. Of course. And that, that is that uh, we, we are a 1% for the planet company. That's an NPO, NPO that grew out of uh, the Patagonia company. And what that means is that we give 1% of our, of our total sales to um, environmental organizations. And the main organization that we support is the Harbor School. And we're, we're interested in supporting them because of their oyster restoration efforts that are ongoing in, in uh, New York Harbor right now. And it, uh, there is just, there's a great thing available online about this program, and it's, it's, uh, it's Andrew Refkin's blog, which, calls, which is called Dot Earth. And as we speak, there's an ongoing discussion um, between uh, the Harbor School students and the public on uh, restoring oysters to New York Harbor. And I think anybody interested in oysters and the environment um, would find it very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely recommend checking that out. I know we had talked a little bit about Paul Greenberg's recent piece in The Oyster and the Storm, talking about some of the history of oysters and oyster farming in the New York uh, city area. Such a fascinating topic that we'll definitely continue to explore here on the Farm Report. We are going to be uh, taking next Thursday off as it is the Thanksgiving holiday, but then we will be back in action. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, all of our programs, as always, are archived on our website, www.heritageradionetwork.org. You can also find us on iTunes or through Stitcher Start Smart Radio. We are a uh, 5013C nonprofit member supported organization. So if you like what you hear, we are definitely counting on you to support our operation. You can visit our website and become a member today. Uh, tons of great benefits from like minded uh, sustainable businesses across the country. And we'd love to hear your thoughts. So shoot us an email info at heritageradionetwork.org. We will see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks so much. It's been another episode of the Farm Report. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening.
what's hot at the green market? You're about to find out now. It's the Grow NYC Market Update. All right, what is up? We are on the line with Liz Carollo, Publicity Manager for Green Markets uh, through Grow NYC. Liz, been such a busy couple of weeks at the market and Thanksgiving coming up next week. I'm excited to hear what you have in store for us. What uh, should we be looking for this weekend at the market? Great. Thanks, Erin. Um, first things first, we're home. The Union Square Green Market was displaced. Uh, Con Ed and FEMA made the Union Square Park kind of their central headquarters for the last couple of weeks. Um, so we were up in Madison Square Park for a while, but we um, we split the market in two last week, or yesterday, sorry, with half the farmers at Madison Square and half the farmers at Union Square. You can imagine how that went. Um, <laughs> and so we should be fully back tomorrow, and if not tomorrow, then Saturday for sure. The last of the Con Ed trucks are leaving either tonight or tomorrow morning. So, um, so that market will be back and we'll be able to end our growing season strong, but of course it stays open year-round, four days a week, and so do 22 of our other markets. Always something good from Green Market. Yeah. Well, what what do you have on the agenda for us uh, for the big turkey holiday? Can we get turkeys at Green Market? Oh, yeah. We have bourbon reds, um, your regular delicious white broad breasted that you see on most Thanksgiving tables, um, a variety of heritage breed ones. Um, our blog at growingyc.org, on the front page of our website, you can see our blog to the right-hand side, has a list of farmers selling turkeys, who has what breeds, how much they cost, um, where you can order them, where you can pick them up. So all that info is there. Um, Also, a lot of other great ingredients at the market right now. Cranberries, Breezy Hill Orchard is bringing cranberries to the 57th Street Green Market on Wednesdays and Saturdays, and the Mount Sinai Green Market next Wednesday and Union Square. Um, But just, you know, the market is so full of everything you need for your Thanksgiving table, from centerpieces to extra butter, because you know you're going to need it. Um, Turkey, winter squash, Brussels sprouts, mushrooms, fennel, carrots, potatoes, onions, sausage, oysters, apples, pears, quince, the um, homemade pies straight from the farm, butter, lard, cream, herbs, cider, hard cider. So I could go on and on just about every ingredient at the market is perfect for Thanksgiving. So um, I know shopping at my neighborhood market, which is Greenpoint, uh, the week of Thanksgiving continues to be one of my favorite and most quintessential New York traditions. Markets at its most bountiful, and um, a lot of our seasonal growers, for them it's their last week at market, so it gives us a chance to kind of say goodbye and wish them well over the winter and look forward to seeing them again in the spring. Now, um, will you guys be doing any special markets for Thanksgiving? or be, I mean, just because I know there's this weekend and then there's, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, for those of us like myself who tend to procrastinate, are there any additional markets available? Or? For sure, yeah. Our Thursday and Friday markets are, for the most part, rescheduled to Tuesday and Wednesday. So you should just look at your individual market web pages. Um, on our website, so and it'll say the schedule change at the top, like 97th Street Green Market in the Upper West Side is a really popular market, and that market will be on Wednesday instead. So we have a lot of markets like that that reschedule, and of course the Union Square one is huge the Wednesday before. But um, but yeah, so a lot of shopping happening Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And I think like one of the other things that's often intimidating for folks during the Thanksgiving holiday is people who don't normally do a ton of cooking come out. Um, Do you guys have resources for people looking for some recipes or some different ways to use um, less familiar green market products? We sure do. We're finishing um, up our recipe packets right now. So we'll have free recipe packets at market all weekend so people can pick up. It's free and it's a whole, um, it's probably 20 to 30 recipes centered around Thanksgiving and the ingredients that are available. So they're great. Yeah. Awesome. Any other not to be missed items for our Thanksgiving tables? Yeah, um, I would I would encourage people to try out some of those non traditional ingredients that maybe you weren't thinking about. Uh, Best Farm Kitchen has these incredible jams and chutneys um, for your crudite platter, including their cranberry horseradish chutney, which I've been known to eat out of the jar with a spoon. It's really good. And Rick's Picks Green Tomato Condiment, um, he uses it in a recipe called Friday's Friend. So it's a day after the feast treat and vehicle for getting rid of some of that leftover turkey. And now you mentioned a lot of the markets. This is the going to be their last week or two weeks. What happens to what happens to all the farmers? What happens to all the managers when those markets shut down? 
So um, the farmers, you have to ask the farmers individually because some of them have some pretty good winter stories. A lot of them go on vacation or just kind of go into hibernation. Some of them take different jobs over the winter. So um, it's worth asking your producer kind of what, what they do during those colder months. Um, a lot of them actually have kind of diversified their farm and still continue to, at markets over the winter. They've put in greenhouses or hoop houses. So um, you see more and more of our seasonal growers stay um, longer into the season. But our market managers, they, they come on seasonally. And, um, yeah, because it's our last official week, I really wanted to give them a huge shout-out um, I mean, without our seasonal market managers, we wouldn't be able to run our 70-plus weekly markets. Um, you know, well, we're asleep in our beds at 5.30 in the morning, any given day of the week, starting in May. They're standing in the street, welcoming farmers, getting the market set up, rain, snow, sweltering or blazing cold temps. They are out there making game day decisions, dealing with anything and everything that's happening on the streets of New York, which anything and everything happens. And they do it with enthusiasm and a smile on their face. They're all incredible people, um, truly the backbone of our program, and they really shined this year. So I wanted to give them a shout and, and tell them they'll be missed. And, um, yeah, they were, they were really incredible, um, and I'm going to miss them. We'll have to just wait till next year, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, last year, many, many of our market managers came on. It was the most... Um, the most I had seen since I've been here about seven years. So I think that maybe maybe we're doing a better job training them or appreciating them. But uh, considering the beating that they take through the season out at market, it's like it's just incredible to me that they even come back and that they do and they love it. So um, we appreciate them very much. Awesome. So I know you guys have been participating in some relief efforts uh, in in the wake of Superstorm Sandy. Um, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's going on in that regard and if there's any other kind of upcoming uh, events that we should get on our calendars. Sure. I wanted to give a shout to Donate a Bag. Um, many of our markets, we, we started this just a couple days after the storm, and we're continuing through Thanksgiving and probably through December and maybe even beyond through the winter um, if we can figure it out logistically. But we're asking customers, it's really, very, very simple to just purchase extra produce while they're shopping, and then they drop it at the market info tent. And we have a distribution system set up to get it out to kitchens. So um, in the last, just the last couple of weeks, we've collected over 20,000 pounds of produce, and we're delivering it to organizations and community kitchens like Greenpoint Reform Church, Yorkville Common Pantry, Mosbia, Added Value Farm, Rockaway Rescue Alliance, who's doing door-to-door hot meals. So they're, like, doing the hard work out there. They prep all the food. They're delivering it um, hot to people, you know, our neighbors who need it most. So, um, so we're going to continue to collect it. It's kind of a win-win-win. The customers get to make a donation and feel good about that. The farmers, you know, get more sales right at the end of the season, and we get the food to, you know, our community. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good program, and it's been uh, it's been great to watch it kind of over the last couple of weeks, and hopefully we can go strong into Thanksgiving and get some more donations. That's awesome. And you guys yeah. also have something coming up with my old chef, Mike Anthony, right? Yeah, yeah, Mike Anthony. Um, he's going to sit on our Educated Eater panel on December 6th at Jimmy's, it's a free event. It's about mission-driven distribution um, with a highlight being on Green Market Co., our wholesale program, where we're working with mid-sized growers in New York State um, and Jersey and our region uh, to distribute food to grocery stores, bodegas, restaurants. Um, so we'll have a nice conversation with Mike Anthony and some of our staff that night. Awesome. Definitely recommend checking that out. And if you want to learn more about uh, what's happening at the Green Market, info on the farmers um, or volunteer opportunities, you can always visit them at www.grownyc.org. Like them on Facebook, follow them on Twitter, just whatever you do, check them out and then tune in next week for another Grow NYC market update. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at HeritageRadioNetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. 